Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 91st episode of Career Podcast. And let me tell you something. I'm super excited because we're getting close to the 100th episode, which is something that I, it's kind of unrealistic to me because my, at the early, like, you know, in the beginning of the year of 2021, uh, I remember it was January 1st, I recorded episode 14 with the Miss Rene Chaffins from Chicago. Uh, I clearly remember that. And my, like, you know, just my long year resolution was to reach episode 50, you know? And, and actually, episode 50 was with Ozoma Danko from Nigeria. Holy shit, my memory is good now. And we're getting close to episode 100. And why it's important? Because uh, it's it's just, you know, we're, there's a lot of reasons why it's important to me. But in general, it's something that I'm super proud of that I, I've managed to, you know, record this many episodes. At the end of the day, I just wanted to, like, with this, like, to put make everything short and get to actually the interview, to not ramble so much. Um, the whole point of the podcast was to make an impact, you know, in my in my life. Like I was, you know, I was kind of sick of like, you know, not, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but I think you guys could, you know, relate to it, not being just, just existing for the sake of existing. And you have no, you don't feel like you're impacting anyone's life or anything. And that's one of the re- main reasons I actually started the podcast and started do, doing this because it's actually one of my passions as well. So, and, and I'm happy that I actually got a lot of messages that a lot of people actually love the podcast, you know, whether from, I get messages from Iran, Iranian artists, you know, or people who follow Iranian artists because of course my home, home country. And also people from outside all around the world, like, you know, they're enjoying it. They're sending me messages, you know, supportive messages or how, you know, they enjoy the podcast, you know, they learn a lot. So it's super, you know, encouraging for me to keep continuing. And I, and I promise you as long as I have a functioning body that can contain my brain like that's so technical and weird to say it like that put it that way but i but i will as long as that's the case i will keep making episodes and episodes and episodes as much as i can and well with that rambling aside let's get to our guest today our today's guest is mr chris tobal he's a character designer at dapper labs and also a graphic designer as well he's and first People who've been, you know, paying attention to the whole NFT space, Dapper Labs seem, might seem like a pretty familiar name. Well, Dapper Labs is the reason that the studio behind CryptoKitties and one of the biggest, like, you know, Ethereum blockchain, you know, NFT projects that's out there right now. And he also worked on NBA Top Shots. So we have someone who is pretty experienced in the field of, you know, NFT art and all that sort of jazz. And we're, we're on this call with him on we're having this call with him from Vancouver, Canada. So, I mean, you might, right now where I'm recording is 9.27 p.m. And I think the sunlight in his room can, could kind of indicate, you know, we're two separate parts of the globe right now, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, all right. So with that introduction out of the way, let's get to the first question. Give us a little, in, give us a little introduction on how we got into visual arts and design. Hey, Ramtin. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, well, my my background comes from graphic design. I am current. I'm originally from Chile, and I studied there graphic design. I worked on that uh, some years, like seven years, and then I started to think about that. Uh, okay, graphic design is interesting for me, uh, but I would like to explore more other areas as an artist and I started yeah I, I started to think to study again and I came almost six years ago to to Vancouver Canada to study and then I started to work at Dapper Labs. All right and were you originally studying art and design or you were pursuing another career path? What I mean by that is like when you were a teenager or in high school um did you know from then, from the start, that you wanted to become an artist or were you very, I don't know, because of, you know, you maybe thought that time, you know, that wasn't a stable life, hmm. like pathway in life. You were studying something else, like maybe biology or engineering or something, because that's a, a common cliche in a lot of artists, you know, I've talked about and my yeah. own path as well. Well, how was the case for you? My case was uh, maybe kind of like similar to other artists, artists in terms of, okay, uh, you're good at drawing. Maybe you started when you were a very little kid. That was my case as well. But uh, like becoming and being uh, strong to think that you're an artist was a longer process to achieve it. Uh, 
that's why maybe I went through something safe for my country, like someone working at graphic design could have more chances to get a job or a pretty stable life. Um, so my my pathway started from maybe not being super um, uh, like super clear about to be an artist, more like be connect, being connected with some skills related with that. And graphic design at that time was the best option for me. Yeah, but then uh, there was like a second life for me, I would say, coming to, to Vancouver, to, to, to Canada and studied again after my 30s and trying to be more connected with video games, animation and that kind of stuff that maybe were harder uh, in Chile at that time. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, for m many reasons, like countries like, you know, Chile and, you know, I think a, lo a lot of like neighboring countries from over there and also like, you know, basically underdeveloped countries, you know, like countries in the Middle East, my hometown as well. Um, they're like the whole level is just stuck at a level that uh, it's basically stuck at the basic survival stuff that there's so many things and problems that we have that we don't that usually people don't even care about art or graphic design or even good graphic design, you know, um, that stuff. So yeah, unfortunately, because of that, there's not many chances and you usually artists, you know, resort to, you know, taking freelance works from those countries or, you know, yeah, um, having to, having to immigrate, you know, leave everything behind and to, you know, have a chance at actually, you know, just make it in life, you know, as you, as mm. just, you know, that's the best way I could put it. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I think, yeah. Uh, sorry. I think now it's e a little bit easier than when I was thinking about to going into the animation and video games industry. Uh, I think right now there's more chances to be a better freelancer if you are from a country like mine. Uh, I think the, 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 the internet and different courses that you can get and the online um, artists that you can follow and maybe they can mentor you, uh, can make the things easier. And maybe you don't even, to, uh, maybe you don't have to think that you will need to move to pursue your dream. Also, I, I know that there's a lot of studios that are getting better in South America and, and in my country. Maybe at the moment when I was planning to, to move, it wasn't so strong enough, but now I think it's getting better. So uh, all the things are changing, especially because of that. Uh, yeah, maybe because of these situations like COVID, where people cannot move abroad and and there's more chances to maybe get a freelance job or that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same in, you know, like, for example, in Iran. I mean, it's actually like... It. It's similar, but it's actually worse in Iran. Like, here's here's the thing. Um, for by the way, for any Iranian viewers or Farsi speaking viewers who are watching, I love you to death. You can you can watch the full version of the podcast on uh, YouTube. You know the video version and the you know the audio version, of course, on Spotify, Castbox, you know, and all that other fl platforms. Just a shout out to them. <laughs> and the thing is, like in Iran, if you want to take freelance jobs, first of all, like you know, art station and like. Not most. I, I'm not going to use the word most. All of the websites that, uh, you know, provide, you know, a platform for people to freelance on them. Um, because of the sanctions, don't have the option of Iran when you want to sign into it. So what they do oh. is they, you know, kind of have to turn around it. So what they do, they put their location as Baku, Azerbaijan or Istanbul, Turkey, you know, or something like that. And usually try to find a friend okay. outside, you know, or sometimes paid in crypto. And that's actually one of the beautiful things about crypto. That you know, it kind of it's completely decentralized. Yeah, you know, that's true. and that's mm -hmm. that's a fun thing about it. And um, yeah, that they have to do all those sort of stuff, you know, a lot of times. And most websites are all also filtered. They have to use you know VPNs and you know um, mm -hmm. other softwares. And another thing is that recently, it's uh, the whole internet thing is going to like in the Senate of the Iran. Actually, it's kind of ironic to call it the Senate because Senate is for a democratic system. Sheesh. And, um, okay. Yeah. And Tricky. they actually accepted the fact that there's going to be a new rule that they're going to change. Basically, in, a, in the shortest way possible and the easiest way I could say, they're going to turn the internet like how it is in North Korea. It's going to be internet. 
And yeah, that's what dictatorships do: control the flow of internet, but and information. But mm. let's not let me not start rambling about something completely off topic. Let's move on to the next question, which is. All right, we've now gathered some information about your past and, you know, how your come-ups now. I actually want to start with an interesting question that I usually ask every artist, you know, because it's something interesting to me always, which is, how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a project? Like, how does your pipeline of work from zero to finish look like? Could you explain to us? Um, yeah, yeah, very quick. Uh, can be basically getting the brief or if it's personal thinking about ideas um, that could be interesting for me to, to move forward. Like it's hard for me to say, I, I could describe one way at work at Dapper Labs and maybe describe another personal one, but in general, it's kind of like thinking, okay, what's the, the, the intention? What's the brief, the concept, um, the goal, the goal that we will have with the illustration or with the, character that I'll need to, to work on. And then there's a, there's a maybe usually like half of the day or a day where I need to um, get reference. Uh, for me, reference are very important. Um, uh, that will make me understand better uh, how wide I can go with my approach. Um, and after that, maybe I will start sketching uh, Put in some ideas on paper, um, then review reviewing those with, with myself if it's personal. Like, this make does this make sense, or uh, is getting the special connection that I want to pursue or not? And if it's something related with my work, I'll I'll, I'll have that discussion maybe for those concepts with my art director. Um, we will see which one works best, and then we'll go the process of uh, going into final art. But I would say that uh, reference are quite important. Just to just to feel that you're making something interesting that is accomplishing the goal, and hopefully that can be creative and a little bit different from other stuff. Uh, I know that's tricky for all the artists. Uh, there's many things going on, a lot of information, different platforms. But usually that's why referencing is good to it's good for me to 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 avoid. Uh, things that can be uh, similar to others. Pretty interesting. Yeah, that's actually like about the references that I heard, like, you know, some people that, um, like I mentioned before we started recording of the podcast, I mentioned the certain artist. I, I'm sorry to anyone who, if I butcher his name. Uh, Kim Jong something? No, not Kim Jong-il, the leader of North Korea. No, no, that's someone else. Sorry. Basically, the South, famous South Korean artist, you know, he's yeah. really cool. And everyone knows yeah. him. Yeah, you've probably seen him. Yeah, I mean that guy. And the artist that does... draws uh, without reference and straight. Like, yeah, I know which one is. I, I'm yeah. pretty sure that most of the people here is, is getting the idea of who it is. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the, you, I'm glad that you actually mentioned that he doesn't draw, you know, he draws with, without references. That's technically correct, but practically no. Because, for example, someone like him, he um, maybe not every morning, but you know, he for a long, long time he practiced and studied references so much that he's got to yeah. this level. It's not like you can cheat your brain around it or anything like that. Like, trust me, the references are super important to learn. You know, actually to get an idea. Like, but if you, if you can't like draw the normal stuff from references, you're not gonna draw this amazing creative stuff. You know. That's like, you know, everyone will tell you this. Yeah. And um, all right. Now, actually, let's, uh, we've reached the general chat, our general art chat part of the podcast. And I actually have a lot of interesting things we can talk about. The first thing is mm -hmm. that, you know, for anyone who takes a look at your Instagram, the, he, is there something, there's like a, a particular number that is like yeah, impressively high, like 4,401 posts till now, just as I'm reading right now. That is like, you know, a, a good, like, just quite amount of dedication, honestly. Like you got the marathon runner mentality, honestly. And mm -hmm. first of all, is is that, are you doing a challenge in particular? Like, you know, people or something, you know, that he did for 13 years and is still going? Like, are you doing something similar? Well, I, I would start from, from the moment when I was studying here in Canada. I took the animation concept art program at Vancouver Film School. 
and I had such a good um, uh, classmates and and mentors, teachers, and one of those is Jesse uh, Winchester Schmidt. Uh, he is amazing. He has super cool plein air, such a good art director. I think he's currently working a in some projects here in the animation industry. Uh, so at that time he was my my instructor and and we had a conversation at that moment where he told me, okay, Chris, what do you want to do as an artist? Which is kind of like tricky. I don't know if he said exactly that phrase, but something like that. And my main focus always was characters, uh, especially when I started to study. Uh, so he kind of like pushed me a little bit uh, into a challenge and he told me, okay, well, if you want to be a very good character designer, why don't you try maybe one, two hours per day drawing people, hopefully your whole life. Uh, and I don't know if that was like joking. Uh, and I think we were into a pathway of saying, what about three hours instead of one or two? Okay. And from that day, I started to, to draw three hours every day. I started to draw three hours every day in different places here in Vancouver. At the beginning, was only focused on characters and people at coffee shops, people in the streets. Uh, I even did it when I was traveling. I went to Japan, to my country, Chile, and I was doing it there crazy, but I was trying to do it with all my effort, uh, just thinking that I would, I would be a little bit better if I would go with that process and because I was, because I still believe a lot in my instructor. And so I was pretty, pretty motivated because of that. But because of the COVID, uh, I had to change a little bit this uh, daily challenge and I wasn't able to go to coffee shops or places. So I started to make it uh, wider and I started to do the challenge every day, three hours, but focus on different stuff uh, like uh, film studies, character design, uh, personal projects, you name it. And since then, yeah, the process has, be, has, has been the same one in terms of time, but different in terms of um, goals. And maybe I'll, I'll be changing that uh, in the future, but hopefully not the three hours at least to draw the size of my work. That's actually quite admirable, honestly, like you, that you could, you know, still you know grinding and you know going with this you know whole personal challenge that you got going on for yourself i mean that the, we, we can all i think take it like a lesson from that like can not lesson like sorry that's the wrong word like inspiration from that you know to have i i personally believe in power of consistency like you know if you do something consistent like because i have experience and you know and i'm still doing you know stuff that i'm consistent with for a long time like uh i mean there's a power to it it kind of structures your mind in a different way, you know, when you want to start doing stuff. You kind of get a taste of what it's like to build something up, like, you know, brick mm -hmm. by brick. And when you walk, you know, when you do something for a long time and you see the result of it, you know, you build upon it brick by brick and you walk away from it and you look at it from a front and you're like, whoa, it's a building now, you know? Mm -hmm. One yeah. of the best examples I could give is a podcast. Like, I was at the... You're doing the same process, man, like with yeah. this... Podcast, yeah, yeah. And for me, uh, another reference, it's mm -hmm. uh, athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. I really love sports and the Olympics were great. Uh, seeing those guys that are preparing every day for that moment, the whole yeah. life maybe of those guys. Like, So uh, every time that I'm thinking about this, it's kind of like what you said, consistency, uh, trying to enjoy the moment, even though sometimes you can be frustrated, but that's kind of like the, the common thing among artists and, mm -hmm. and keep it uh, consistent through the process of doing something like an, uh, like an sport, uh, a sport uh, an athlete would be doing it to be better in their discipline. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that maybe I won't be the best in the things that I'm trying to improve, but that's not the main thing. It's more about mm -hmm. challenging yourself with your previous person uh, and it's always good to see what you did at the beginning because my first sketches were very, very, very bad if I compare them with 
some of those that I that I'm doing right now. So at least you can see the process, you can see the, the story of doing something and seeing some improvement. Um, yeah. And that's super, super nice to, to see and remember for me at least. Yeah. Two things I want to mention from this is that um, the last point you made is super like important and I actually believe in that as well. Like, you know, social media has turned people into this thing that only posts the best stuff, you know, especially Instagram, you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> like, it, it's so fake, you know, and I know it, I sound super cliche and stuff like that. I know, I know, but it's actually super fake and it encourages people to like, you know, good things actually take time, you know, and especially for artists, like I recently, I think Pascal Import, I mean, he's a famous illustrator. I mean, everyone yeah. basically knows him. He actually made a post about it, like recently, like, you know, about this whole subject. And like, you know, yeah. good things take time. And by the way, for anyone who's wondering why my head goes down is because I'm scratching my itchy foot. That's why you don't, you didn't need Perfect. to know that, but now you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thing is that great things, take time and the whole nature of social media makes us worried and anxious that oh my god i should put it i i should you know be active and put stuff out consistently that's how algorithms work i mean it yeah it's true but i for example not, it's not the main thing uh yeah. if you don't want to post post your stuff it's okay it's perfectly perfectly fine as long as you can keep consistency maybe not sharing that but keeping your daily work uh that's super, that's the most important thing, not showing that because it doesn't matter. Honestly, for me, mm. it doesn't matter too much. I'm, I'm always joking with my, my partner here that uh, how how many likes you would like to have. And and we joke about that. Wow, it would be cool to have several. But she knows that I'm joking, that I'm just mm. trying to do something every day different or mm. make it consistently through this process of learning. And the platform maybe in the future won't be there, or maybe will be another one. But as long as you keep doing it, eventually you will see the results. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, in that. exactly. And like for example, from my case, like you know, I started like digital art like recently, like in the past couple of months. And I and I'm gonna be honest, like I'm not consistent with the tutorials at all because I have like other sides in my life, other aspects in my life that I push through. Maybe that's just a fancy way of excusing myself of being lazy. I don't know. <laughs> But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for example, I post everything, like, you know, even the sh just crappy sketches and arts, you know. And okay. the reason I do that is because, first of all, I like it and I use Instagram as my own personal journal kind of, you know. And second, mm -hmm. when you post this bad stuff and you're someone who has actually loved the craft and you know you're going to do it for years and years in your lifetime. And you also put your great stuff after years. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see from where you were and where you are now, you know, in the future. That's my whole point of view. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, and all right, this is, I said two points from yours. And the, and the other point is like, I think if I could, you know, translate, you know, a lot of the words you just spoke to us is that basically you're doing this stuff. One of the reasons is for, to feel fulfilled, like personally, mm -hmm. like, you know, as deep inside, feel fulfilled because... Um, basically, I don't want to get too philosoph philosophical or go, go on another ramble, but yeah. um, at the end of the day, like it for everyone, it's different when they start to realize th realize this fact that the thing that matters is to feel fulfilled, like spiritually and personally. And like you know, if like you're, here's the thing, if you get all the money in the world, sure, I mean it fixes a lot of you know technical problems or anything like that, but. Do you, like, for example, you got all the money and you die, all right? Before the moments you close your eyes and actually die, sorry if it's getting too dark and gloomy, this whole podcast, but I don't care. <laughs> like, the before the moment you die, how much peace you have is based upon, like, you know, how much, how you lived, how much you lived without regrets and, you know, the stuff you did that made you feel fulfilled, the challenges you overcome, mm. all of that. They're like your personal achievements, you know, and stuff like that, because you know them. You like, you know, the stuff you do that you do because of yourself, you know, and you're proud of yourself. Those yeah. are the stuff that matters, not the stuff, you know, or, or I got this amount of money or I got this position and this apartment. I got this many friends and all of that, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at uh, the end of uh, the day, we're trying to feel fulfilled. Yeah, go on. No, no, I, I really connect with what you said. And I would mm -hmm. say that uh, this is something also that I'm doing for the Christopher from before coming to Canada. 
the one that maybe wasn't drawing too much or that wasn't believing too much on himself, um, not thinking that he could be a good artist. And those years that maybe I lost uh, procrastinating or maybe doing other stuff, I'm trying to, basically now I'm trying to catch up all that time uh, just to, to show to this previous Chris that it's never too late. Uh, I'm close to get 40 and and I'm just trying to, to be the best artist and person that I can be for that previous Chris that I left when I moved to, to Canada. Mm. Yeah, that that's actually quite admirable. Um, that Because I, I could imagine that a lot of people, I think, around your age wouldn't have the same, like, you know, courage and, you know, self uh, like self confidence in themselves to actually do that. So, I mean, that's actually a good example, you know, for anyone who might want to, you know, um, for for example, if you're listening to this podcast and you're 21 and you're like, oh my god, I went to the wrong major in university and I lost so much time. Um, yeah, yeah. Here's no, the thing. Man. Yeah, you you. It's that's never late. Time. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, there's a yeah. there's a lot of time. And actually, like, I actually want to ask you something kind of unrelated. You said you're near 40 right now, but how do you like inside? How 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 much old do you think you are right now? Like inside, how much do you feel? What I'm trying to ask. In terms of an artist? No, no, no. Just in general, you know. How much do you think? Because, for example, I'm 24 right now. Like I turned 24 two months ago. But like honestly, okay. I I still kind of feel like an 18 year old. Maybe I'm still ah. immature. <laughs> but right. Uh, yeah, kind of like yeah, that. pretty. Yeah, I think that I'm very mature now than maybe before coming to, to Canada, but that's another thing related with moving to a country that is not yours and that is, oh, yeah. and that is different, different from the culture that you already had. Mm-hmm. Um, that process of going and start from zero your life uh, makes you grow up a, a lot, a, at least to me, and I had to do a lot of efforts to keep uh, uh, working here in, in Canada, it wasn't easy. So, yeah, I, I think I'm very, very mature, and that's maybe something that helps me to be consistent uh, because of that experience, all that experience that I got uh, when I became here. All right, awesome. Mm-hmm. And all right, the next, okay, before we move on to the next questions, there's one last thing that I can't just not ask you. Is that yeah. in the introduction, I already, of course, mentioned that you're a Craig character designer for Dapper Labs and especially CryptoKitties, and you're also working on NBA Top Shots. First, let's uh, deal with the short ones. That doesn't take much time first. The NBA Top Shots. For anyone who doesn't know, like, you know, um, I'm not going to speak about NFT collectibles and NFTs for 10 minutes, just introduction. Um, do, a, do a quick Google search of the terms I'm going to mention. For example, NFTs, NFT collectibles. Yeah, just yeah, that just is two. Then you can continue listening to this podcast if you're if you actually okay. if you're actually interested. Um, the NFT collectible that you that I think you're still working on, as you said, is NBA Top Shots. It's basically like you know uh, clips of you know famous basketball players doing you know goals in basketball and stuff like that. If I'm not wrong, um, which is actually something super popular. And um, first, tell us about your whole opinion on and also just your story of working on these projects and. The whole okay. NFT world and everything, like in general. Yeah. So after studying here, I started to apply to different jobs and seeing the chance of staying longer in Canada. That was my goal. Just not getting the diploma, but also trying to learn and work in the industry here, which is bigger in terms of games, studios, and animation studios. And I got the chance of starting to freelance for CryptoKitties almost three years ago, when I heard about those little kitties, uh, uh, maybe on 2017, they were super in a, they were getting a lot of attention and hype. Uh, and they, they still are a very, very good collectible game, uh, maybe the best one uh, in their category, where basically you collect different kitties and you can trade those, or maybe you can sell them uh the most important thing is the getting the sense of owning and collecting that 
they are valuable for you um, and that and it doesn't matter if they're expensive or not there's some sort of strongly connection with with your collectibles so i i started to to freelance for dapper labs at that moment and doing different fancy cats and then i started to work full time uh working on those for at least a year and it was such a good experience learning from maybe not too much about crypto because i'm not an expert but understanding more this this other option of yeah this decentralized uh the economy and the chances for you to 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 trade to to own uh, things um and then i've been supporting other projects at, at upper labs now i'm more focused on nba top shot with which is what you said basically a collectible game where you can own moments from different nba players um, and i've been working illustrations for that game for at least one in year uh yeah more than a year and graphic design as well mm -hmm. Awesome. And actually, um, I like past couple of months ago when like, you know, I mean, NFTs has been around for a while now, but I think the kind of so-called NFT boom happened like, you know, I think late fall of the yeah. last fall and early winter and stuff like that. With the, I think it got really like, you know, everyone started paying attention when people made $69 million of his sale. That's yeah, when so... everyone started to, you know, kind of pay attention to the whole space it was similar to 2017 but maybe stronger and we had the chance of work on this very unique project where you have such a important brand ip behind which is nba and and it's a worldwide brand right so all the people in the world is fan of basketball and when you say basketball you just connect with NBA, it's kind of like the same thing for a lot of people, even though I know that in Europe, there's a very good league. But besides of that, uh, having this support uh, from NBA to create this game, I think may, made the things better for us to, to get that kind of impact that we had at the beginning of this year. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. And there's just one thing I, I don't, as I said, I don't want to get into it too much because I'm going to not stop talk about it for like, you know, hours. And it's actually mm -hmm. something I had a plan to make actually a, an hour YouTube video on the whole thing because I actually did a huge amount of research on NFT collectibles and stuff like that. So I'm, actually, I found some interesting thing about CryptoKitties as well. Like, I think I can, like, if I get a chance to speak with the creators of it i can actually tell them where to get the inspiration from i by the way i'm not saying they stole the idea or anything but uh -huh. the, ins the inspiration from like um it's actually I i'm gonna say it because uh, it's actually super interesting to me okay how and i'm gonna say it because there, it has a point to my world from sonic the sonic adventures game from 1998 it had a section which there was a child it was like a side game something that gave the game like you know replay value Basically, you owned, you had these eggs and you cracked them and there's like cute little creatures called chows, you know? And they mm -hmm. have different attributes and you give them different animals, they get different attributes of those animals and you put them all against each other to a race and, you know, there's a whole system to that. And it was from 1998. And before I even knew CryptoKitties, I was like, oh, almost like, oh my God, that's such a good idea for an NFT thing, you know? And then I realized what CryptoKitties are. I was like, oh, Ramtin, you're late. You know, because yeah. everything, like, like, it's so close to each other. By the way, I'm not saying, you know, they did the right thing. It's what I'm, I'm not saying they stole or anything. I just want to make sure about it. They took inspiration and it's super fine, you know? Uh huh. And the thing is that the point I, I made by saying this is that there's a lot of opportunities. It's, it, there's value in, like, you know, getting, going back in time and just, you know, researching and studying different pieces of media from the past maybe 80s and 90s and stuff we might get new insights and ideas we didn't have because imagine with the stuff we know now, now right now about nfts maybe we come up with a lot of you know cool ideas i mean an nft is just an example by the way like there's a lot of cool mm. ideas even when it comes to you know art and you know story writing and stuff like that you know from the past i mean there's a lot of inspirations out there and that's actually super interesting mm. by the way just another fun fact at 1998 when this game came out i was one years old and yeah, that's so weird to think about, you know, this stuff, you know. 
I think also to complement what you said, it's that a very good team makes the things better. And honestly, I, I, I didn't create CryptoKitties at all. Uh, and the creators were before me. Uh, but I came to this studio with such a talented people uh, supporting you during the process. Uh, and usually the best results that I got was because I was working closer with my art director, with colleagues, and we were thinking beyond maybe some constraints. Uh, so I think also that helps to 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 make a, a big impact, like when you, you can do the things not only by yourself, but with a strong team. And that's the reason why uh, CryptoKitties was so powerful and successful, because the idea was pretty good. Uh, some people say that, uh, everything is a remix or something like that. And maybe the ideas are constantly changing and being re reinterpreted by people. So that was the, the best moment to maybe reinterpret something that you would see in the past, but with a, with a very good and strong team behind, uh, not only working you as an artist, because I'm talking beyond that, I'm talking about engineers, game designers, that are involved in CryptoKitties and, and in NBA Talk Shot. So that made the difference so far for all the projects that I'm currently working at Dapper Labs. Yeah, I mean, and as you said, like, you know, when you take an idea that someone did different and you improve, like, important sentence, improve upon mm. it and make and add a unique twist to it is, you know, super fine. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's what that's the reason like this thing that i just explained one is one of the main reasons that we've evolved so fast technologically as in a species like mm -hmm. like i i even remember i wrote i read somewhere that you know wright brothers were slandered a lot because they were like no greeks did that first their first flight or something like that you know <laughs> like you, you get what i'm saying you know, by the yeah, way, yeah, like, yeah, totally. I would yeah, I would love to actually, like, you know, if there's a possibility, I because I'm sure there's not, to actually have a chat with, you know, the creators of, you know, CryptoKitties and other NFT projects, because that's something that I'm super passionate about and interested. And right, mm. before before I just wrap up this whole NFT thing, there's one thing I want to mention is that it's super surprising to me that even a lot of huge YouTubers that make videos on this stuff, they, they're kind of ignorant about the why, like, for example, projects like CryptoKitties or CryptoPunks are valuable. And I'm just going to leave you with this. There's a lot of reasons, but the main thing is the historical value. Now, you might say, Ramtin, what, do, what the hell do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that we as a species and creatures, we've been making art since the dawn of time, you know, since 20,000 years BC, you know. And yeah. in the chron in the history of art, we we've, we've recently reached the completely new point. All right, that it's historically important. You might not, you know, you may be I don't know working in a company or working freelance yourself, and you're working hard freelance jobs, you know, taking as much as you can to make ends meet, and you're mad when someone who just got bought a crypto bank, you know three, four years ago for $100 now is a billion. No, no, not billionaire, sorry, millionaire. And I mean, I, I I understand that, but the truth is that, you know, because it's the first time in human history that we have this, like they were even the first CryptoPunks were actually the first ever project on Ethereum blockchain was called Ethereum, which is, all right, I, I realize I'm going on a rumble, but the, all right, the point is that they're historically valuable, right? And they're mm -hmm. the first, and they're valuable because they're first. There are a lot of you know, other a huge amount of like sea of you know useless garbage, you know NFT projects for the sake of being projects out there because they want to make a quick buck. But actually, these projects are actually they were the they were innovators in this field. What I'm trying to say, and they're the first one to innovate. That's the thing. Innovate. The definition of innovation and innovator is someone who's done it first, you know, and they improved upon it. You know, yeah. Basically, the whole concept of novelty. And when you add the whole NFT, and, and and it's all possible because of the NFT technology, by the way, the whole, no, sorry, not the NFT technology, the blockchain technology. I'm kind of misinterpreting the terms. Um, and yeah, without getting too much technical, basically it allows us to have unique pieces of, you know, work and files. I mean, yes, sure. You can save, you can right click on the on a CryptoKitty or a CryptoPunk and just save image and boom, you got it. That doesn't mean you have it. 
like when you go to a museum and you take a picture of Mona Lisa, you don't have Mona Lisa. You have a picture of Mona Lisa. It's actually different. But when you have it in your crypto wallet, that's when you actually have the when you have the token of that NFT in your wallet. That's when you actually have it. Like that's how trades happen in this field. I mean, it's because of the whole NFT technology. You can just save it JPEG and just sell it. You know, <laughs> that's not how you can become a millionaire. I'm sorry. I'm so surprised that you know a lot, man. Uh, I think you even know Thank more you. than me, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we can we can actually continue this NFT chat after the podcast because I don't want this episode to turn into an yeah, NFT yeah, yeah. episode. Because because For that's sure. because here's the thing. Not that I have a problem with it, but I know it's not everyone's cup of, cup of tea. And I and I actually had people refuse to come on the podcast because I mentioned I support NFTs, you know. It's, but by the way, oh. I have, by the way, I have nothing against them. I mean, I actually super appreciate. I'm super appreciative that they're honest, you know. I mean, cool, thanks. That's I mean, true. but yeah, it's a bit uh, uh, controversial. And I actually, I think one of the reasons people see that I support NFTs is because on the highlights of my stories, I support every artist from the podcast that's been on the podcast that they put out NFTs. I highlight their, you know, NFTs in there as a way of supporting, oh. you know. And they're like, oh, you support mm. NFTs. You want to destroy the environment. I don't want to come in on your podcast. All right. By the way, sorry. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent again. Sorry. All right. Let's move on to the next question. I hope, by the way, for anyone who listened to this segment, I should learn a bit. Uh, and if you had any comments or criticism or anything like that, I, I'm super, actually super glad and pumped to, you know, hear your, you know, stories, ideas, opinions on this whole stuff. So leave them, leave them down in the comments as well, whether on Instagram or YouTube. And I'll definitely check them out. All right. So. Let's move on to the next question, which is something that a lot of artists, you know, have problem with. I'm sorry if, for asking you this because I know it's a bit of a hard question. No, it's not a super personal, you know, inappropriate question. Don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. who are your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? Uh, yeah, that, that's a hard question when you see such amazing artists through your life. Uh, but... Yeah, if I if I go back and I go when I was younger, a kid, maybe Akira Toriyama's work was the very very strong thing that uh, got me. Uh, Dragon Ball was such an important part of the the process of seeing uh, character design and um, not only anime but art uh, and Ayao Miyazaki's work. Uh, almost at the same level of importance were, was super inspiring since I saw Totoro, uh, my neighbor Totoro, like on maybe in the 94. Uh, I know that the movie is older, a little bit older than that, but uh, that's the moment where I watch it. So yeah, those two artists and are mainly the, 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 the people that inspire me and when it uh, push me to 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 see if in the future I could be an artist. And sometimes you you know some sometimes you can see on your work some things that maybe you saw in your uh, artist uh, that maybe you kept that in your mind and maybe the way to design the eyes or the ears or the expressions were were a little bit connected. So maybe there's something also from from Akira, Akira Toriyama and, and Miyazaki-san over there. Right, Both uh, senseis for me at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of evident that they're your that they're your senses because you m mentioned them as son, Miyazaki-san, you know? Not many people have that, you know, kind of uh, respect when, you know, mentioning their names. Yeah, well, uh, I'm a little bit fan of anime and manga, but my partner is... Japanese descendant, so I have some connection uh, there. I'm sorry, who? Only, uh, my, my partner is oh, Japanese nice. descendant, so I have some sort of connection with the culture because of mm. her, besides of the the, the, the the art that I was mentioning. So some words are uh, staying with me, uh, maybe more than before. Uh, but yeah, I really admire, admire those two guys. Uh, it's it's super cool to see their work all the time. Yeah. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned anime and manga. I want to ask you this. What are your favorite mangas and animes? Yeah, so Dragon Ball is the very 
the most important one for sure. Then I would say Doctor Slump. I I, I really like the the funny and super weird sense of humor that Toriyama put on those two works. But almost in all the mangas that he created, you can see that. Also, the way that he create props, um, characters, uh, mechanics. I, I think that's super cool how he resolved that. Um, I really admire also Takehiko Inoue. Uh, he is the creator of Slam Dunk, uh, a basketball manga from the 90s. And he created also Vagabond, which is a samurai manga. Uh, I I really love and, uh, and I admire the, the process of him as an artist going. You can see on his work from the, the beginning of the 90s that was it was okay, but when you see his latest work, his understanding about uh, anatomy, about painting, it's such a such inspiration. He just improved his level a lot and seeing that process through his work is amazing. Yeah, so those three, four mangas, uh, I would say that are very important. Also Nausicaa, Nausicaa uh, which, which is the manga that Miyazaki created, and then he made the movie about it. Uh, it's also super, super inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Like, I the only thing I watched from Miyazaki is just Spray to the Way, which is actually one of the, my favorite animes I've ever watched. I watched it first when I was a child. Like, I was, I think, mm-hmm. seven, eight years old. And, yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of messed me up as a kid. Like, it was kind of, like, horrifying for me. <laughs> Like, you know, that I've never seen, like, those type of cliches and dynamics between characters, you know, at that level. So, yeah, for yeah for a child. It, and the interesting part, I think I read somewhere, that the amount of detail and care he had, you know, for the whole story and everything, he specifically targeted this, you know, made this whole spirit of the way for, like, you know, 10 to 12-year-old, like, basically little girls. You know, so, they, mm-hmm. so those demographic could relate with the protagonist of the story most. Like that was the, but we don't really pay attention to these nuances. That like I think this type of nuances like really make some works like you know spirit of the way very like you know timeless in my opinion. You know. Yeah, I'm a fan, so I would say everything that he created is awesome. But I think that revisiting his work right now can be so important now that we have this yeah. problem with our world and how he was putting attention to take care of the environment through his work and seeing what's going on right now with our planet uh, just make me think that, yeah, he wanted to see something, I mean, put a, a voice on topics that are important to understand and remember in terms of uh, taking care of uh, where you live, uh, of nature. And that's another thing that I really like about his work it's always there and the 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 environments and well besides of that the art the environment design the the the, all the the scenarios that he creates are just amazing all right and let's move on to the next question Uh, but the next question is what technologies and softwares do you mostly use for your works by technologies i mean the hardware and uh, by softwares i mean i mean of course the softwares yeah, uh, for personal work, I mostly I'm mostly focused on Procreate. I pretty much all the daily works and daily um, the studies that I'm currently working, I draw those through Procreate. Sometimes the sketchbook, but usually there. And for work at the studio, I'm always working with Adobe, so Illustrator, Photoshop. Uh, mainly those two, plus a little bit of After Effects if, if I need to support a little bit of motion design. But that's not like the common thing for me. All right. And that's just pretty interesting. The, I mean, the you speaking of, you know, personal works, the next question is kind of related to that. Um, what to, what what are you working on right now that you can tell us about? What kind of project is it? I mean, of course, if it's something that there's an NBA, in, not NBA, so sorry, NDA involved, I mean, we can skip right past this question. But if that's not the case, tell us what you're doing right now. 
Okay, so this is challenging. It's a challenging thing every day because sometimes I don't know what to draw, and usually that's a common thing that all the artists has when they want to keep it consistent and work on projects, personal projects. So usually I'm working with uh, topics that are related with the day. Uh, like if if there's a, for instance, a birthday of an artist that I really admire maybe a, a, a director, uh, I would try to make a film study or an illustration of that person. Um, sometimes I leave the, the option of people uh, helping me with the process and I start to thinking about characters and their relationship so I can create one character. And then through Instagram, I will ask who could be with this design, I mean, this character that I'm working with. Um, and also I'm planning to, to uh, organize my time to a personal, deeper project in terms of storytelling, uh, something that I can put uh, maybe on my portfolio and describe not only how well designed it was the character, but also the story behind. So I'm currently thinking about it. I have a, a, an idea that hopefully I can try to work uh, in between of those three hours that I that I'm drawing every day. All right, and what area beside the area you're working on right now, which is of course you know art and you know graphic design and stuff like that, would you be interested to explore and learn in the future? What I mean by that, by this question, is like imagine if you had like you know enough extra time in your life and energy and resources and just everything you know everything was you know ready. All right. Yeah. And there was no need to work and you had extra time in that situation what would you do or it could be you know learning something it could be anything you know and it could be completely non-art related as well this question's aim is to that us the audience and me get to know the personality of you a little better a little bit better you know um and it doesn't have to be related with art itself right yes mm-hmm yeah, so probably I would try to go beyond the daily work that I do and learning languages would be something interesting to, to approach. Uh, maybe doing, yeah, I think something that I still need to do and COVID didn't help with that is going outside, drawing from people or environments, maybe painting would be something cool to, to make more consistently. Uh, so maybe do plenaires would be a good goal, uh, hopefully in the future. Um, but yeah, I would try to to make more room for things that can complement yourself, not only as an artist. So maybe playing an instrument, learning uh, a new language would be something interesting to tackle. Because uh, usually we at least. What happens to me is that sometimes I, I, I'm very close to those ideas that I'm trying to create every day, and I'm and I'm not thinking maybe doing something that can break that routine. So I would try to break it more, and with something that can be different and and not art related. Hopefully, um, I'm also always checking different courses. Uh, I, I, I had one course recently that I took, uh, and I, and I'm hoping to take more from people that I admire, but, uh, if the time is better with me, I would go beyond that first. All right. Pretty interesting. And well, with all that being said and done to conclude all the discuss, give us a roadmap for someone who is zero in visual arts and wants to get to the place you are in terms of skill set. Like, you know, from here to here, what main steps do you think they should take to get to your level? You know, when it comes to graphic design and character design and, you know, just any skill you have in arts right now. So you mean, what should I improve or... Uh... No, I mean, imagine someone who is zero in art and experience, but they have an interest and they want to start, oh, okay. you know, doing the things that you do. All right. So from oh. zero to get there, what major steps would you advise them, like in short and general answers, you know, for them to take? Yeah, I would say first, not think and compare yourself 
with other artists would be the first the, f the first thing and setting up uh, small goals uh, for a process of learning and when i'm when i'm saying that is basically trying to see that if you can keep consistency on maybe draw draw every day hopefully and that doesn't have to be hours can be minutes uh, but just trying to push yourself to make something not only one day it's kind of like when you do exercises when you do push-ups whatever uh you won't get results if you just did it one day but if you do push-ups maybe for a month uh maybe not every day but three days a week and then you start moving that into four or five six seven days uh after some months you will see uh, changes or progress so it's more about setting up small goals and also checking all the time people that you admire and uh, trying to understand how they resolved some uh, designs um, usually when you get inspired you get better results in terms of uh, ideas or things that you can incorporate and readapt to your process so small steps hopefully every day and check in and seeing artists that you admire, I think will make a big difference at the end for you. All right. And that's actually something really uh, important that just uh, the whole thing about consistency, trying to break it down into like, you know, giving analogies of push-ups. Like, uh, and just one last analogy I want to tell is that imagine you have a pile of bricks, all right? They're just a pile of bricks, but you can make something out of it. And for example, you you oh, that's actually such a good analogy. I just realized that's actually two hundred IQ analogy. All right, you have a pile of bricks, all right, and you can build anything with it. So first, come up with a plan and a structure of what you want to make. You know, first, just write out your path, like what you want to do. Like you, all right, you want to get into art. What niche do you want to get into art? What do you want to become a concept artist? Do you want to become a character artist? Then. After that, maybe even go deeper, like what kind of environments you want to work on. And when you have that goal, you have that blueprint now. Now you can just, all you need to do is just put in the bricks and, you know, go up and make that big pyramid, pyramid or building or whatever you want. And you walk away a bit and from the far you see, you can see your whole progress. You're like, wow. And that is, that is not possible if you're not consistent. I mean, that sounds mm. super super cliche and simple but people don't realize that you kind of have to develop this kind of grind mentality and attitude like you know it's not it's not something that everyone has like most people have like it's a really small percentage of people who actually can push themselves to actually learn this mentality and i mean everyone can do it but you know not everyone does it i guess because it's hard and but yeah but if you if you add uh, maybe the the important point of having fun with that, mm -hmm. I think, will help. Yeah, if you feel that you're you're not having fun, maybe it can be uh, not so useful as that should be one of the main uh, fuels for your engine, your artistic engine. You know, like okay, yeah. maybe it's tricky, maybe it's hard to do uh, this process, but I'm enjoying the the ride, so uh, I'll try today a little bit and maybe tomorrow. Uh, careers like ours uh, are connected with passion and with love. And maybe that's another cliche, not that you're mentioning cliches, but it's true. Uh, if you if you really love this, maybe it will be easier to tackle and do the process of consistency. So it's more about finding what moves you, what you love, and pr probably that will help a little bit with the process of consistency. Yeah, and here's the thing, like, you know, you definitely, you know, hit the nail on the head. And I was actually going to mention that as well. And the way you can be consistent with something is either, you know, tough it out, which is, of course, you have to do. And the hmm. second thing is, if you have the passion and love for something, love, that's an important word. You don't have to be disciplined. You just do it every day. You just need every possible free time you have, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. If you actually love something, you don't care about whether you win or lose at it or get successful at it. Like, for example, here's the thing. Um, I, I love chess, the game of chess. 
and I and I when I ask and here's the funny thing when I ask anyone to play, for example, or friends or whatever, they say, "Oh, I used to play chess. I'm not really good. I'm gonna practice a bit." And you know, because because they're afraid of losing for some reason. Like it matters. Like it's a game, you know. At the end of the day, and here's the thing: when I ask someone to play, like I play with my cousin, he's like is like an international master level and I always lose, but I don't give it, uh, but I don't care. I try to keep this podcast <laughs> as PG friendly as possible because for possible okay, okay. Spon- <laughs> sponsors and anything. And it's kind of funny because in the first 30 seconds, I remember I said shit and I said it again second time. So, it's, so it doesn't matter. So yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that if you love some, something, you don't care if you win or lose at it, you know, you just keep doing it for the love of it. And that could be, you know, yeah. said about, you know, any other aspect of your life, you know, so yeah, yeah that's, that's why important. it's good to sorry and that's why it's not so good and useful to compare yourself with others uh even if it's hard to not do it because we have a lot of uh platforms where you're seeing every day such a wonderful artists and it's hard to not feel that wow i really would like to get that level but uh if you really are happy doing the process and just trying to compare yourself with the previous person that you were as an artist, uh, you should be okay. Uh, that's another thing to, to help you with the process. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, actually, whatever was on my mind, I forgot it. So never mind. Let's just move on to the <laughs> next Sorry. thing. No, no worries at all. No worries at all. Um, all right. So we've reached the end of this podcast, but there's. Actually, I've not the end of the podcast. We've reached the final question of the podcast, oh. which is, which is, uh, yeah, it's kind of technically a question, which is, which is a segment I recently added, which I wished I added it from the start. It's called Final Words. Wow, so dramatic. But basically, all right, I'm going to explain what it is. Right now, for anyone, it's been like an hour and two minutes right now. We've been recording. And for anyone, who, for example, who's, I'm talking to you, by the way. And for anyone who, who's who has been listening to this podcast you know at this point you know they come to this point and they're listening right now and also for anyone who might listen in maybe i upload this episode like to edit and upload it like you know two two days later a week later for anyone who might listen to at any point in future maybe two weeks later maybe when i upload it they up- upload it maybe 10 years later maybe 20 years later you have this right now a space and window of time to leave any it's like a time capsule that's basically the philosophy behind this section if you could as a human leave any message or maybe even multiple messages if you want you know behind to anyone who's listening as a human to another human what would those be i know it's a heavy question so take your time if you want uh well maybe to connect all the things that i mentioned before it's kind of like saying it's never too late uh never too late to to pursue dreams uh, if you are an artist that, and you want to try that out, and you, if you feel that it's too late for you or you're too old, uh, no, it's not related with that. It's more about um, being focused and happy with the process of learning and being admired, and per, uh, sorry, and be at, uh, and admiring other artist and that's gonna be key to to help you out um, um we shouldn't be worried about other artists and how how good uh, are their stuff it's more about being happy with the learning process and the challenge of becoming a little bit better than yesterday for you uh, so yeah timeless yeah don't worry about time uh just be focused on what are the things that makes you happy. And if that's related with art, well, maybe try to have fun doing that um, and just trying to be better in that way as you maybe would like to be as a person. All right. That's actually a beautiful note to end this episode on. And well, thank you so much for... Cheesy, maybe. No, 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 <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> and all right. So thank you for coming on the podcast for this episode for episode 91 and where can people contact you if they had any questions is there instagram okay i put it in the caption yeah yeah totally uh if i if i can help some people with questions or if you if they want to reach me 
for something related with my work, yeah, they can go through my Instagram, uh, J A R A O S O R I O. Jarosorio. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Those Jarosorio. Yeah. Two, Jar my oh, two yeah. Last names. Yeah. Uh, or basically, you can go to my website, uh, cristobaljara.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that could be the, the main two ways to, to reach me out. All right. I'll definitely put them both in the captions and everything. So, you know, there's no worries about that for the contacts. And well, thank again, thank you so much for coming by. And just before I close off this episode, I want to mention something like literally right now, I got a message like, by the way, I mean, don't call me out that why are you looking at your phone while recording the podcast? That's disrespectful. Yes, you're right. But I mean, I check, you know, sometimes notification from the top. I don't open the messages. So, you know, it's not that bad. But here's the thing, I just, if you're in this Discord NFT servers, you're going to get so much scammer, you know, messages. Like, the first official NFT pump pumping server is here. Join us and get rich or cry <laughs> later. Like, I'm not actually yeah. exaggerating. That's what it's wrote. And yeah, I mean, don't, this is not a good plan to invest in shit coins. I mean, yeah, I mean, Dogecoin was different. I mean, that was a whole different story. But yeah, don't invest in like, here's the thing. Don't invest in crypto if you don't believe in the technology of whatever you want to invest in and only invest the money you're willing to lose. All right. That's very important. That's think about it. That's very important. That could be said with any investment. But a lot of people, I mean, unfortunately, because they there's a huge demand, like a lot of people are in trouble and they want to quickly make a quick buck, you know, to maybe fix some of their life problems, which I totally empathize and, you know, understand. But there's a lot of scammers out there, specifically for those gullible people who don't know much about the technology, which is kind of fucking scummy. Mm. And yeah, just don't, yeah. Stay smart with your money, do your research, and watch as much YouTube videos you need. And be cautious. But I'm not saying this to you to discourage you from the world of crypto and NFTs. It's actually a super interesting thing to explore and learn about. But yeah, just keep an eye out. That's the short version of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and all right. Thank you, anyone who tuned in and watched this episode. I did really enjoy it, honestly. It was a really fun episode. And thank you, sir, for coming on this episode as well. And that's about it. Take care, everyone. See you next episode. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.